Okay, so good morning to all, or good afternoon, or good evening, wherever it is that you are. I'm in Boston, so it's good morning for me. Um, thank you to the organizers first for uh, inviting me to uh, give this talk. Um, I'm going to tell you about work from my PhD that was done in Trinity College Dublin, as well as in uh, GSK in England. Um, and it's on a new post-translational modification called uh, malonylation and how we found a role um, for it in signaling in macrophages. So uh, there's been uh, two talks already on this today, so I feel like it's been well introduced uh, and I don't need to go into too much detail about this, but essentially, um, a, a big area of research in the last uh, 10 years is, is immunometabolism. So it's this idea that if um, you manipulate the, the metabolic status of immune cells, you can uh, literally alter their function. Um, so you can see here a summary that probably needs updating by now um, on some of the changes that occur in a macrophage mm, following their activation with LPS. So there's um, increased glycolysis, increased uh, ADP production, and there's accumulation of certain metabolites. Now, the only one that uh, you need to care about for the uh, point of this talk is that um, citrate. So citrate uh, accumulates in macrophages that have been activated with LPS. And that's interesting because among many other things is uh, it can generate malnoid-CoA which can then post-translationally modify proteins uh, in what we call malonylation. So um, here, uh, here's what uh, malonylation actually looks like. So malonylation was only discovered about um, 10 years ago, I think, or less. Um, there was very little to nothing known about it when I started my PhD. But what we did know is that it modifies lysines. So you can see the lysine amino acid here. And following uh, malonylation, here you get this extra tag put on the amino acid. Um, and there are two sources of malonyl-CoA in macrophages. So one uh, comes from the cytosol. So there's acetyl-CoA in the cytosol, and this enzyme, ACC, can generate malonyl-CoA, which can then, with the process we still don't understand, um, end up modifying the lysines. And this process can also occur in the mitochondria, where there's actually two enzymes. So there's both ACC as well as ACSF3, which can, again, generate malonyl-CoA, which will end up modifying lysines in uh, malonylation. And to this day, we still don't really understand how uh, this happens. We, the only thing we do understand is that this is a reversible modification, so it can be removed uh, by an enzyme called uh, CERT5. Um, so, you know, we, we knew that um, metabolism could impact cell function and that these metabolites and macrophages uh, could determine things like cytokine production, which is extremely important. And we also knew that we had this metabolite modifying proteins and, and we didn't know what the function of that was. Um, so when I started, our main aim was to investigate whether maybe this malonylation was a mechanism that the macrophage was using uh, to impact function. And so the first thing that we did was uh, measure malonylation in macrophages, which no one had done before. And I hope you can see my pointer. Um, there's this Western blot here where you can see we've blotted for malonylation. I'm following treatment with LPS here. You can see there's an increase in malonylation levels in macrophages. So essentially, we were able to show that when you activate macrophages, malonylation levels go up in the cells. Um, so the next thing that we wanted to do was to identify the proteins that were undergoing this malonylation. And for that, we did mass spec. And what we found was that the 
identity of the proteins that are being malonylated is extremely wide. So it seems to impact multiple pathways within the cells. So there's proteins in here are the different pathways that are affected. So there's proteins involved in RNA binding that are being malonylated. There are proteins involved in cell differentiation that are being malonylated, transcription, translation. Um, it's many different proteins. It's not just metabolic proteins that can be malonylated. Um, so this was very interesting, especially this uh, top RNA binding function, which I'll come back to. Um, and one of the top hits that we got is a protein called um, GAPDH, which is what we chose to focus on to try and figure out what exactly the malonylation was doing to all these proteins. So um, we were able to validate that GAPDH was indeed being malonylated. You can see here that we pulled down, uh, so we isolated GAPDH from these macrophages. And what we found is that if he, the macrophage has been treated with LPS, GAPDH is indeed very clearly uh, malonylated. And this is something that we were able to show through many multiple independent experiments. So either via IP, we also have a chemical method, which I'm not gonna go into the details of, uh, but you can clearly see this band, which is GAPDH only following the treatment of the cells with LPS. Um, so again, this is an antibody independent method of uh, validating the post-translation modification. And then <coughs> we were also able to do um, mass spectrometry again to identify exactly where within GAPDH was the uh, modification. And we found this lysine here within the catalytic domain, lysine 213, uh, that was only coming up in the GAPDH that was isolated from cells that had seen the LPS. So only uh, macrophages activated with LPS have GAPDH malonylated in lysine 213. Um, so at this point, what we knew is that you activate a macrophage with LPS, citrate accumulates, then ACC1 is able to generate malnoin-CoA from this. And then somehow malnoin-CoA is able to modify um, GAPDH. And then the question becomes, what, what does this mean? Um, so why would we care about GAPDH at all? Um, so for those of you who um, have worked in a lab doing uh, molecular techniques, you may be familiar with GAPDH as a control. So it's used for as a housekeeping gene in PCRs, it's used as a con loading control in Western blotting. So um, this is as far as the knowledge about GAPDH goes in most people, is control or maybe also known as a glycolytic enzyme. But the thing is, um, oh, my animations aren't working. Um, I'll just talk you through the, the, the processes. Um, the thing is the GAPDH has actually multiple, multiple, many other functions. Um, so it can translocate into the nucleus where it can affect um, DNA binding. It can also associate itself with the mitochondria. It can, it's been um, related to cell death, um, microtubule formation. Uh, essentially, it's, it's a very multifunctional pruning that does a lot more than just um, glycolysis, which makes it very interesting because it's been not um, heavily studied in that regard, especially within immune cells. Um, so, because of that, we wanted to next figure out, okay, we know that GAPDH is being modified following treatment with LPS, but what does it mean? Um, so the first thing we did was to assess um, GAPDH and somatic activity. And you can see here that following treatment with LPS, uh, the GAPDH and somatic activity goes up. So the enzyme becomes more active in the cells following treatment with LPS. So in order to assess uh, what this means, uh, we compared a specific inhibitor of GAPDH, which is heptylytic acid. So GAPDH is the, uh, catalyzes the six step in glycolysis down here. Um, we were able to compare this with a general glycolysis inhibitor. So 
which is 2DG, which inhibits at the very first step in glycolysis. And um, what we were able to show is that um, you can see uh, heptalytic acid here on the left compared to 2 dg on the right. And as you, you can see, when you pre-treat the cells with heptalytic acid, we're able to decrease TNF alpha production. Um, however, 2 dg doesn't do that. So if you're able to block general glycolysis, there's no decrease. If anything, there's a slight boost in um, TNF alpha production. However, inhibition of gap dh specifically uh, it's able to block um, tnf alpha production so there seems to be a difference whether you block gap dh specifically or whether you block glycolysis entirely and what's even more interesting is that if we look at transcription of the tnf alpha gene there is no effect with heptolytic acid so essentially this decrease it's not at the transcriptional level it's only affecting the protein um and okay no animation so you only get to see this piece of the data um so we wanted to explore more of this um protein to rna disconnect that we observed with tnf um i just like to say that, that to simplify things i'm only focusing on tnf um essentially uh, there's also an effect on multiple other cytokines. So gap dh you need gap dh to produce things like IL-1-beta, IL-6, IL-10. But this RNA to protein disconnect is just a TNF alpha specific thing. We don't see that disconnect with any of the other cytokines. Um, and what you can see here at the top, it's, it's a time course in macrophages. So essentially, um, TNF alpha RNA peaks early after a couple of hours of treatment, and then over time, it goes down. However, the protein uh, looks different. So TNF-alpha protein um, is low at the early hours of, of uh, post-LPS treatment. However, following um, eight hours of LPS or 24 hours, it's when it's really high. So there's this disconnect again between RNA and protein. So there's a delay. It, it, this implies that uh, TNF-alpha in macrophages um, is translationally regulated. It's not uh, just transcription. Um, so because of this, we wanted to assess um, the potential of GAP-DH to directly bind to TNF-alpha um, RNA and regulate the translation this way, given that there's been previous published uh, papers on gap dh directly binding RNAs. Um, so that's what you can see on the bottom here. We were able to um, immunoprecipitate gap dh and um, assess via qPCR the RNAs bound to gap dh. And what you can see is that in untreated macrophages, uh, GAP-DH is indeed binding to the TNF-alpha transcript. However, following treatment with LPS, um, that binding is abrogated. Um, so in, in activated macrophages, GAP-DH is no longer binding to the TNF-alpha transcript. And <clears throat> to the uh, bottom right here, what you can see is um, you just need to look at this, uh, the third column here. If you treat the cells with heptalytic acid, which I just showed you in my previous slide, was able to um, reduce TNF-alpha production, there's actually increased binding to TNF-alpha RNA. So what this is telling us is that the binding of GAP-DH to RNA transcript is inhibitory. So it means that GAP-DH is able to bind to the TNF-alpha transcript and suppress its translation. Um, so if we go back to this, in resting cells, you do not need TNF-alpha production. So GAP-DH is suppressing the transcript. However, following 24 hours of LPS, when you need really high levels of TNF, as, as shown above here, then GAP-DH lets go of the transcript so that it can be translated, and then the cell can produce TNF-alpha. Um, so that's um, what we're depicting here. So essentially uh, what I just told you, in resting cells, GAP-DH can bind to the TNF-alpha messenger RNA and prevent anything, uh, the cell to do anything with it, since the cell doesn't need to be making TNF-alpha if it's not active. However, following treatment with LPS, mm, 
two things happen. So one is there's an increase in glycolysis. So GABDH activity goes up and that allows for certain produ production of certain cytokines like IL-1-beta and IL-10. And also the release of the TNF-alpha um, messenger RNA allows for TNF-alpha production. So there's this kind of double mechanism by which um, GABDH is either binding RNAs or engaged in glycolysis. And it's able to regulate multiple cytokines that way. Um, so then this is just the final piece of data to link it all together. Because um, essentially what does what I just told you uh, relate back to the malonylation? Um, you know, is essentially malonylation regulating the activities of GAPDH that I just told you about? And the answer is it is. Um, so we were able to generate mutants of that particular lysine that I told you about, lysine 213. So it's this one. So the, the lysine 213E mutant is essentially mimicking malonylation. And uh, when we assess the enzymatic activity of this mutant, it's elevated. So essentially, it's mimicking what we saw when you treat a macrophage with LPS. So it means that if CAPDH is malonylated, as it is in LPS-treated macrophages, the activity is up. So cytokine production is also up. And then if you look at the um, RNA binding assay, it's the opposite. So whenever we have the, the malonylation mimic, there's no longer um, binding to TNF. So TNF alpha is free and it can again be produced by the cell. Um, so just to summarize that, um, essentially what I've sh hopefully I've, I've shown you is that resting cells don't really have um, that high levels of glycolysis. So GAPDH can go and bind the TNF alpha transcript and prevent its translation. However, when you activate the cells with LPS, there's two things that happen. One, uh, GAPDH is now needed in glycolysis. So it goes and it increases um, the levels of glycolysis so that things like L1-beta can be produced. And then as a result, it also lets go of the TNF alpha transcript, which can now be also translated, which results also in TNF alpha production. And all of this is enabled by the fact that there is an increased malonyl CoA production, which is able to modify a malonylate gap pH. Um, and with that, um, I'd just like to thank um, my PhD supervisor, uh, Lou Conio, as well as, well as uh, Moritz in the RAP, who helped me with some of the work I've shown you today, as well as some of my uh, colleagues at GSK, which also helped, especially uh, with the mass spec uh, that I showed you at the start. And uh, the paper is available online, Nature Communications, and it's open access. So if you want to uh, learn more about it, um, you can find it online. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Galvan Pena. So we do have one quick question. Um, can you just comment on the production of interleukin-10 and IL-1-beta at the same time? Um, in terms of does gap dh affect both IL-1-beta and IL-10? Yes. So the rest of the question says, I assume this is through different groups of cells. Is this a self-regulating mechanism? Um, no, this is a self-regulated mechanism. So it is all, um, uh, so it's just different timing. So essentially, um, if you block glycolysis, you can block both IL-1 beta and IL-10. It just won't happen at the same time because the cell first produces IL-1 beta and then produces IL-10. Um, but you need glycolysis for both. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much for your talk. So next we will welcome Anita Goyala from the National Institute of Immunology in India, who will be speaking about polyunsaturated fatty acids and P38 MAPK pathway, bridging the gap between metabolic reprogramming and cytoprotective 